Well, as many of you know, we are um, getting close to the end of our Scent series. We've been in this series for several months, uh, and, and uh, today we're going to be in Acts 26. But uh, we're another two weeks in this series, and then we're going to be moving on to uh, the Beatitudes, uh, looking at uh, Matthew. So uh, it's going to be a, a good time. Today I've titled the message, Making a Stand, and hopefully uh, when you leave today, uh, you'll be challenged to do just that. In September of 2013, a Minnesota Dairy Queen had been swarmed with dozens of phone calls, hundreds of comments, and an influx of business after a story about their 19-year-old manager uh, courageously defends a blind man and it went viral on this thing called Reddit, which is like this on, online news source. It says, Joey Prusek, who had been working at this popular fast food restaurant for nearly five years, told The Blaze uh, paper, uh, Wednesday he, had, uh, he was shocked and was sickened by what he saw to a blind man at the hands of an elderly lady. Prusak said that last Tuesday, one of his frequent guests, a man who is blind, walked into the local Dairy Queen, and when the blind man took out his wallet to pay, a $20 bill slipped out of his pocket. An elderly woman behind the man then quickly snatched the bill off the floor and put it into her purse. Prusak took matters into his own hands, and he explains. She walked up to the counter. And I asked her to please return the $20 bill to the gentleman. She looked at me like, you know, what are you talking about? And Prusak said, uh, uh, recounting the situation, the incident to the blaze, he said, I asked her again to return it, and she said, no, it's mine. I just dropped it. I told her that I'm not going to serve you if you are going to be disrespectful as you are stealing someone's money. The woman then allegedly became very disorderly and began to begin cursing at Prusak, and he remained both firm and polite. The woman then allegedly became disorderly and began uh, just kind of freaked out, and so she started getting really angry, he, he says, and started swearing and whatnot. I stayed relatively calm, and, and then he says, uh, he goes, I deal with customers on a daily basis, but she just kept swearing, and I asked her to leave the store. I told her that if, if you aren't going to return the money, you need to leave right now. Then she stormed out, Prusak said. But it's what the 19-year-old manager did next that stunned customers who saw the incident as they were waiting in line. What happened next, I would never expected an anonymous customer wrote to Dairy Queen, which was later posted in Reddit, sending the story viral. Your employee approached the old man and took out his wallet and said, Sir, on behalf of Dairy Queen, I would like to give you this $20 that you happened to drop on the ground as you walked away from the counter. I was in shock by the generosity that your employee had, taking his own money out of his own wallet to give, that customer, to, give to the customer because some other lady decided to steal something that wasn't hers. The customer continued in his letter. Back to Prusak. Prusak said, it was the right thing to do. I felt it wasn't right that he got ripped off by someone like that lady. It just wasn't right. It wasn't the right situation, you know. I just got instantly sick, Prusak added, noting he frequently serves the blind man and just felt sick to my stomach, he said. Since the letter... Uh, to Dairy Queen from the anonymous customer was posted on Reddit. The story has gone viral, resulting in a flood of support and, uh, to this small business in, in Minnesota. Prusak said business doubled the following days. Hand me that microphone, would you? Thank you, sir. We're ready to go. All right. Prusak said that the business doubled the following weeks to, and days to come, and, as, uh, and that dozens, touched, dozens of touched customers have called him to thank him for his actions. But he said his boss's reaction was one he will forever remember. He said he wrote me a note 
And he put it in an envelope, and it goes like this. It says, you're the type of man I'm proud to know. And then Prusak said, that means a lot to me. I mean, what a story. I mean, what, I mean, 19-year-old kid standing up for what is right. Amazing. Talk about making a stand. Well, today's story is similar Because Paul makes a stand. And Paul believed by sharing his story, by doing that, it was the right thing to do. And so as we open to Acts 26 today, and again, uh, we're going through an entire uh, chapter. So uh, nothing like what Frank had to deal with last week where I don't know how many chapters you went through. It was like, seemed like half the book of Acts. And uh, oh, it was only five. Because you can do that in like no time, right? What, it took you 15 minutes, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> kind of funny. Anyway, yeah, so Frank uh, left off last week. And the story actually starts back in chapter 25. I'm going to kind of paraphrase. And as we've been challenging, as we go through the book of Acts and, and taking such huge chunks, that we always encourage you to go back and read the story for yourself. So... As we left off from last week, Paul has been under house arrest in Caesarea uh, for about two years, okay? And during that time, uh, a new governor comes to the area, this guy named Festus. How'd you like that for a name, you know? I think of Fester. Anyway, Festus. So he arrived, uh, and and the Jewish leaders see this as an opportunity and and a good time to have Paul finally convicted. Because Paul's been on house arrest, just still preaching, still teaching, still doing his thing. And so Festus is hoping to gain favor uh, with the people by sending Paul back to Jerusalem for a religious trial. So that's what's going on here in Acts 26. But Paul refuses to go back. And he asks to be tried in Rome since he's a Roman citizen and he had every right to do that. And Festus agrees to that. A few days later... Uh, King Agrippa, who's the great-grandson of Herod the Great, and his sister Bernice show up. And they came to kind of visit Festus and and, uh, pay their respects to this new governor. So Festus, you know, being a a political guy and smart guy, asks Agrippa his advice on what to do with Paul. Agrippa, you know, he wants to hear what Paul has to say. I'm sure Paul was pretty renowned by that time. So once again, Paul gets to share his story. He gets to make a stand for what he believes. Now this is the third time in the book of Acts that we see this. In chapter 9 and chapter 22 and now here again in chapter 26, Paul gets to share his story. And it's a beautiful story of how he comes to Christ. At the end of his story, both the men... Uh, are not necessarily persuaded to follow Christ, but they both agree that Paul, that that he was innocent of of making or doing anything wrong. And even had he not appealed to Caesar, he would have been set free. But he's willing to make a stand. So that, in a nutshell, is kind of chapter 26. Interesting. Interesting. And so I did title today, Make a Stand, because Paul made a stand. And so... That's the what. Now the so what. What does that mean for us? So what does that mean for us? If you're taking notes today, here's the question, the big idea. Do we stand for what we believe? I think of Joey Prusak. Here's a guy who was convicted, who stood for what he believed in. He believed in customer service, right? He believed in doing the right thing. Obviously, he had probably been uh, taught the right thing. So do you stand for what you believe? Especially if you're here today and you're a follower of Christ. So just breaking this down a little bit, kind of the, you know, some things that kind of came out to me. Number one in your notes is that Paul cared more about those around him than his own situation. I mean, here's Paul. You know, he's, he's a prisoner. 
And at times he'd been in chains and doomed to die. But he was saved. He had the assurance of forgiveness of his sins. And, and he was waiting his inheritance to be ushered into the presence of God. See, he cared more about those around him than his own situation. Philippians 2, 3 and 4 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only, after, or only, uh, not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. So it's okay to take care of yourself. But we should always be looking at the interests of others and for them and looking out for others. And that's what Paul was doing here. Paul was not the one in trouble here. It was those who were listening to him, wanting to hear more about what he had to say. I mean, Agrippa and, and Festus, I mean, while in all outward appearances, looked like they had it all together. I mean, we live in America, right? In America, we all seem to, we all look like we have it together. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to travel to uh, third world countries. I'm not sure what the uh, real, what you call that nowadays. I forget what it's, you know, they don't call it a third world country anymore. But boy, when, when I've had the opportunity to go to third world countries and I, and I see people, children that are still having fun in the streets with nothing, it, it makes me wonder. It's like, you know, do I, do I have it all together? Do I have it made? The deal was that these guys were lost. They were headed to an eternity separated from God. So no wonder Paul was more concerned about Festus and Agrippa and Bernice and, and all those that were watching and looking and listening. See, he had to make a stand. So I guess one of the things that I'm going to throw out to you today, something to really process this week, is, is how often do we think about ourselves and our problems before considering others? Number two, Paul's defense was his testimony. See, in this case, in Paul's case, describing what he once was and did and how uh, the good news had radically saved him, is what he had to impact his listeners with. And for us in here that have a personal relationship with Jesus, that's the one thing, I mean, we've been talking about this for months, about how important our story is. We have this opportunity to impact the world with our story. Because our stories will do the same thing. I'm going to pass out a piece of paper. It's in the back. And it's just called, you know, My Jesus Story. Uh, I think Redwood's doing this. And I think Pastor Mark talked about this last week downtown. But uh, I'm not going to take the time for us to fill these out this morning, even though I, should, I should, probably should. Because it's probably like, you know, not normal to do that in church, right? But I want you guys to, to look at this. And, and, you know, we're talking about our testimony, we're talking about our story, but here's just some practical notes on how to develop a story if you've never done that. Most of you already, I mean, you know your story that have come to Christ. I might have ran out. Okay, if you need more, let me know. I'll have to get more printed off. But my story is pretty simple, you know? Your life before Christ. Now, if you got saved as a little child, there wasn't a whole lot of life before Christ, right? You were born. Now, the one thing that gets me sometimes is people say, I've known Jesus my whole life. Well, actually, you haven't. Because when you were a little kid, you, you don't comprehend that yet. So, just something to think about. I do remember when we were younger, my wife and I, um, we used to have people read scripture to Brenda's stomach. It was the coolest thing ever. That They were just reading the word. Uh, and, and, you know, it was, 
good, good stuff. The next thing is how you met Christ as Savior. And the last one is life since meeting Christ. And that's just kind of a little three-way thing that, you know, if you're getting in a conversation with somebody, just a, a way that you can stay focused on your story. Maybe you're here today and you don't have a Jesus story. Maybe in the process of this, it's, you're still at the point of your life before Christ. And so I would ask you today to consider a personal relationship with the living, loving God. And you can start your story today as well. Number three, Paul reveals the deep-seated animosity towards Jesus. And if you've walked with Jesus very long, and you've been trying to, if, if you've been like very uh, outspoken maybe about your faith, you've probably ran into some issues with people. Because a lot of people, for whatever reason, they just don't want to hear it. I look at Paul. Paul was once a very religious man, a Pharisee. But as a Christian, he is now a true Jewish man, enjoying uh, and looking forward to the hope of Israel. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 17, he says this, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Guys, as followers of Jesus, you know, he, he, we follow Christ because Christ has fulfilled the law that no man could ever do. That was the biggest issue with the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the time, is they were, they were thinking they were all that. They were thinking that, that, they were, that they were fulfilling the law, but they actually weren't. So when Jesus came, if you guys remember any of the story of Jesus, I mean, he was always kind of getting in the face of the religious leaders. Also, the conversion of the Gentiles is really not that much different. And that's why we're here today. Because I, I don't consider myself a Jewish man. I'm a follower of Christ. I'm a Christian. And what happened was, you know, Paul went to the Gentiles. And because he went to the Gentiles, because he stepped out in faith and did what God called him to do, we're sitting here today. It's pretty cool. What is God calling you to do to step out and make a difference? And you may never, I mean, Paul obviously isn't here 2,000 years ago. I mean, a lot of time's gone by. But I wonder if he would walk in here today, he would probably be just blown away that there's a group of people that meet in Murphy, Oregon to worship Jesus. Why? Because Paul was willing to step out and make a stand. Anyway, people do not evolve in faith and towards faith. They're, you know, prone to actually hate God, to oppose the gospel. People cannot be logically convinced and converted any more than Paul could. See, in order for us to be converted... God must radically and powerfully intervene into the lives through the power of the Holy Spirit, convincing us that Jesus is alive. It's Christ overcoming death is what gives us the ability to get saved. And we have to believe that he is the Messiah, the sent one. But yeah, there's this deep-seated animosity towards Jesus who just came to save us, but we're a prideful people. We want to do things our way. And really what it is, is letter A there in your notes, is that, that people have a natural disposition to have a hard heart. How do we know that? Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Because of sin, we are separated from him, right? 
See, Paul's fellow Jews should have recognized Jesus and the gospel to be the fulfillment of the promise of God through Moses and the prophets. But they wholeheartedly opposed it. They did this contrary to the scriptures, to history, and to logic. They did so because of the hardness and the hardening of their hearts. And Paul was just like them in that same way before he was saved. Hebrews 3 says this, 12 and 13 says, Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning you away from the living God. You must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. New Living Translation. So understand when we're sharing our story that there's a lot of people out there that kind of have this hard heart. And maybe they've been burned by the church in some way. And they don't quite understand. That's why I feel like your story is going to be way more valuable than just inviting somebody to church. That they hear your life and how God has changed your life. That's how it's going to make a difference in the world. And finally, number four. Paul reminds the people that Jesus rose from the dead. What Festus says in verse 24 of chapter 26, basically, Paul, you are out of your ever-living mind. You're crazy, somebody raising from the dead. That's nuts. And guess what? As you share that kind of thing, I mean, we talk about it all the time, right? The resurrection and the life. I mean, we're Christians. This is what we believe. But that's kind of crazy to a non-believer, right? It's like, that's just wild. But guys, it's that resurrection is what gives us eternal life. It's what gives us salvation. I mean, if you're a believer, do you really believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Because because he did. He resurrected. Guys, that is that is a key. That is a non-negotiable doctrine of Christianity. I mean, many of us followers of Christ believe in principles, truths, and doctrines. But we refuse to actually make a stand and put them into practice. I mean, we may say we believe in the goodness of God and his omniscience, knowing all. And his omnipotence, having all power. But when times get hard and when life seems to challenge these truths, many times we are not so willing to act upon the truths which we claim to believe. Guys, that is what a non-believing world simply believes, that simply believes that it's unbelievable. This is why they, they don't necessarily want to follow after Christ. So I guess that would be a challenge today. That we understand what we believe and why we believe it. Guys, this truth here, it's where the rubber meets the road. It's where we walk the talk and where we practice what we preach. Is when life gets hard. When life doesn't make sense. So as we head out this week, I want to challenge you to walk in truth. What is truth? Truth is Jesus. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So, are we willing to take a stand as we are sent to make a difference in the world? Let's pray. God, today I do thank you for what you're doing in this this little fellowship here in Murphy. And that God, that you 
truly want to make a difference in the lives of people in this community and you want to use these folks right here to make a stand. And I know where most folks are at here today. I know most of the folks here love Jesus and they want to grow in Christ. But God, maybe there's someone here that doesn't know you. And so today, Lord, I just, I just ask. If that's you today, and you're like, man, I, I need Christ. With, you know, every head bowed. If that's you, would you just slip up your hand? Anyone? Okay. And maybe you're here today, and maybe, maybe something in this message really struck a chord with you, and you're, you're like, man, I am just... I'm not making a stand. And you would like to make a stand? Would you just slip up your hand so I can pray for you? Those that are getting ready to head back to school and back, you know, going to work? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Father... I thank you for the lives that you're impacting. And God, I just pray that uh, you give those that want to make a stand in their world, in their homes, at work, school, that you give them the courage that they need to make a difference. Give them a desire, God, to share the truth. Thanks, God, for all that you do. We truly love you. In Jesus' name, amen.